before that, it was Easter. But um, I'm glad to have to be back. And I am really excited to um, introduce our guest today. Um, what I like about the, our guest is that he's got a really, really awesome name. Um, I honestly couldn't have picked a better name for him. But um, so let me introduce our guest. We have Matt Slick tonight. So Matt Slick is the president and founder of the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry. Matt earned his bachelor's degree in social science from Concordia University, Irvine, California. Um, he earned a master's of divinity degree from Westminster Theological Seminary in Escanido, California. He now resides in the Boise, Idaho area with his family. He is ordained and he uh, started CARM in October of 1995. He responds to all the false teachings of the cults and on the internet. So Matt will be speaking with us today on why do we trust the Bible? Welcome, Matt Slick, the Slickster. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Um, you know, your name, your name. Slick? Your name is awesome. No, that that slick is good, but Carm. You know how many Carm people ask better. me if I'm affiliated with you? First, it, it always goes down with, um, is that your husband? Are you? Is that your dad? I, I usually say, yeah, you're my dad. <laughs> um, or is that your, um, are you Carm from Matt Slick? And it's always no, 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 no. But it's it's right. a it's an honor to be uh, you know even linked that way. But I have to say, I'm the OG because I am a little older than just a little bit older than your ministry, Carm. So I'm just saying, oh. I'm just saying. and that means you're you're young because Carm <clears throat> is only 26 years old. I'm pro I'm probably around 27. The last I checked, something All like right. that. That's anyway. good. <laughs> but today you'll be speaking on um, why do we trust the Bible? So I'm excited. So go ahead and, and get into that. Sure, no problem at all. Um, all, all right, it's a great topic. Why is the Bible trustworthy? I know a lot of people think that it isn't. And um, there's some principles to look at as well as some facts uh, to consider. Uh, what I want to do first is look at a principle, uh, just something really simple. And I want to go to Genesis chapter 3. And it says there in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. That's Genesis 3.1. The first one to doubt God's word was the devil. Now what happened here next is uh, Eve modified the word of God because God had said to Adam, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of, of evil. And when she repeated it, she said, nor touch it. She added the phrase, nor touch it. So first, the word of God is doubted. Second, the word of God is modified. And then third, the word of God is contradicted because in verse four, a serpent said, you shall not die. Now, that's a principle of uh, what happens when you doubt the word of God. So another thought that I like to give to people is to simply ask a question. Do you think that God, who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, do you think he's capable of preserving his word? Now, this is an important concept because biblically speaking, God has all knowledge. Now, before the universe was ex existed, he had all knowledge of all things actual, which deal dealt with only his own nature in the intertrinitarian communion, and then all things potential that were not yet in, in uh, existence. This means that all things that would exist or could exist were known in the mind of God, and he brought into existence one set of actualities out of a potentially infinite number of, of, uh, of, of potential existences. He brought in this actuality. Within that, we have the sovereignty of God because he is all powerful. He can do whatever he desires. He's all knowledge, has all knowledge of all things. Therefore, he knows what will happen, how it'll happen, and what will be the case with every situation, every time, every place. And so we have here the knowledge of God, which is complete and total. We have the power of God to do whatever he wants. And of course, uh, He's everywhere. So he certainly is capable of preserving his word. The very principle of preserving the word of God is something that we have to understand because God is the one who said, for example, let there be light. God is the one who says, I am. 
in Exodus 314, I am that I am, a phrase, uh, a word that is used multiple times in the Old Testament. God identifies himself. He identifies himself by his word. Now, the word testament in English, New Testament, Old Testament, is from the Latin testamentum, which means covenant. So God covenants with himself in the intertrinitarian communion of, he of Hebrews 1320, where he says, uh, We'll talk about the blood of the eternal covenant. And then we get into, I get into, the, I love talking about this topic, but uh, the point is that, that he co uh, he covenanted within the Trinity to redeem certain people. You can go to Ephesians 1, 4 for that and some other stuff. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because God's word is important. You don't contradict God's word. God binds himself by his word. He makes covenants by his word. He created by his word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible, the scriptures are the word of God. The question then is, is God capable? Is God capable? The one who knows all things, all has all power, can do whatever he desires. Is he capable of preserving his word? Islam would say no. Mormons would say no. And other groups would say no. Humans have the ability and the power to thwart the will of God and be able to corrupt the word of God so it can't be known. And therefore, our prophet, our prophetess, our new revelation, our new church has to be on the scene to correct the word of God, to restore it to its original uh, whatever it is. This is a principle that false religious systems do because they presuppose that God is not capable of preserving his word. Now, some will say, well, yeah, he is capable. He just didn't do it. He let people corrupt it. Where's the evidence for that? People will talk about the Bible being corrupted. And I'll say, well, where's the evidence? Now, what, typically with Muslims, this is unfortunate. What they'll try and do is say, well, the Bible's corrupted. I can show you contradictions. What they're presupposing is the universality of the laws of logic and some other issues, which I'd like to talk about with them and how that doesn't work with their God. But that's another topic, side note. But I'm going to ask them, how do you know it was corrupted? And they're going to say, well, because, well, the Quran says so. Because, because people did this and God let them do that. So then God is letting people, their, their words are, they're letting people, God's letting people corrupt his words so that his truth is no longer represented on the earth. These are the principles behind their ideas. And so therefore, each group that holds to this will then say, we need a restorer of that truth. And in the case of Islam, for example, Muhammad is the one who came and restored the truth. Why? Because he says the Quran is corrupted. Well, is it? That, that what the Quran says? Because I got a question, because if you're going to go to uh, Surah 1094, for example, it says something that's interesting. It says, uh, if thou wert in doubt as to what we revealed unto thee, talking to, to Muhammad, Allah talking to Muhammad, then ask those who have been reading the book before thee. The truth hath indeed come to thee from thy Lord. So in no wise of those in doubt. Uh, so he's saying, if the if you're having doubt about what we're telling you, go ask the people the book. Now, here's a question inside of Islam. Why would it be the case that Allah would tell Muhammad to go ask the Christians, the people who believe the book, the Torah and the Injil? Why would he ask him to go, look, go ask him, go talk to them because they study the book. If the book's corrupted, Allah shouldn't tell Muhammad to go check it out. Why would he do that? It doesn't make any sense. We could talk about other surahs where it talks about the inspiration and the reliability of Scripture, but I don't use the Quran as the authority of the Scriptures. The Scripture itself is self-attesting because it's the Word of God. The church does not tell us what the Bible is. It reveals and recognizes what the Bible is. The scriptures are inspired by the very fact of them coming from the word of God. When John the apostle wrote in Halagas, when he wrote, in the beginning was the word in John 1 verse 1, as soon as he put the first epsilon, N, the E, N, Epsilon nu is the first word in Arche in Helagos. In the beginning was the word. The first time word here that was inspired because it was from God through John onto that piece of paper. This represents God himself. So what people are doing with false religious systems will always do is say, well, did God really say? Is it really true that his word is preserved? Is it really true that what he said is right? Is it really true? Because it's been corrupted. We need to tell you what it really is. And as soon as it's been believed by someone that has been corrupted, then it can be contradicted. And that's what happens. And so that's why, for example, that uh, in Surah 4, 157, it says Jesus was not crucified. 
but it was made to appear that Jesus was crucified. Only made to appear. Well, who did that? Who made him appear as though? It was Allah. You read the Tafsir, and it says Allah is the one who did this. The commentaries say Allah did. So Allah is a deceiver. He's a deceiver. But that's another topic, too. There's so many topics to talk about. So back to the issue of the scriptures. If you're going to presuppose in your worldview that God has either the inability to preserve his word or the will and desire to allow it to be corrupted, then your position, your view of God is that he wants people to be deceived. That would be an, a, a statement of saying the Bible is deceptive and is not true. But the Muslims will say, if it's deceptive, it's been deceived, it's been corrupted, you can't trust it. Yet, as Surah 4, 157 says, that Allah, Allah is the one who made it look like, as the commentators say, that's what I've always read, that Allah is one who made it look like Jesus was crucified when he was not. That means Allah is a direct, by his direct hand, a deceiver. And yet, the Muslims say the Quran is true, and it's better and more accurate than the New Testament, than the Old Testament. Well, it's not true. We know that Uthman brought together varying uh, recordings, as in writings on, on tablets, writings on paper, on papyrus, writings on vellum, on pots and rocks, and what people had memorized. And he put it all together, and he decided where the Quran was going to be, ultimately, and had everything else destroyed. So you have no way of verifying the ubiquity and the consistency of what those documents are. That is supposedly the recitation from Allah to the pe Muhammad to all kinds of people. And then after he died, it was collected and put together. And yet the evidence for the reliability has been, let's just say, conveniently removed. Well, what about the reliability of the Bible? Let's look at the Old Testament for a second. It is the Jews themselves who regarded the Old Testament scriptures to be the very word of God. Now, when we talk about this, we have a, an easy way of just saying in our minds, yeah, they believe it was inspired, but that's, it's not just the case. To a Jew, they had the belief that Moses himself parted the Red Sea and freed the people from Egypt and brought them through that Red Sea and delivered them and had them enter into the land of Israel where they are to that day. Now, there's Abraham, there's Elijah, there's Isaiah, there's the prophecies, there's so much. They believe that the scrolls that they had were the inspired word of God, and they were very, very, very careful in how they recorded and how they wrote what those scrolls were. They revered it. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered uh, in the 1940s. Inside the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran Cave 1, which incidentally, I've actually been in Qumran Cave 1. I've actually been in the very first cave, Qumran Cave 1, where they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a nice little bragging point, and, and uh, what a privilege. But <clears throat> in those scrolls, in the Qumran Cave scroll, Scrolls, they found a scroll of Isaiah. The oldest manuscript of Isaiah that they had at that point was uh, at 900 AD. That was the oldest copy they had, but the Dead Sea Scrolls were from 100 BC. So 100 BC to 900 AD is a thousand years. That's a thousand years of, so to speak, copying. And what did they find? The critics said, hey, you know what? We're gonna look at this. We're gonna show you the, that Isaiah, as representative of the whole Old Testament, has been corrupted. We're gonna show you it's been corrupted. Well, very quickly, they found out it hadn't been corrupted. The critics just were quiet. The preservation of the book of Isaiah as, a, as, a, as an example was so well done. Oh, there's a couple of little uh, jots and a couple of minor things. But you know what? They, even the critics said, OK, we're not even going to say anything. This is significant. It's very important because you have to got to understand that <clears throat> That the truth of God's word, in fact, what I'm going to do is share a screen with you, if I can. Let's see if you, if you can add that in. If you add that screen right there, what I'm going to do is sh share this with you. And there you go. What you'll see here is this is a compilation right here of the different manuscripts of ancient times and their reliability. If the copy of Isaiah was so accurate 
And it was. And that lends the credibility of the entire Old Testament as being very reliable. We'll talk about the New Testament here in a little bit. Now, what we see here is a compilation of, for example, Lucretius, who died uh, roughly 55 or 53 BC. And the time span between his original copy is 1,100 years. The number of copies is two. They don't know the accuracy of the copies because they can't do any statistical analysis because there's not a variability there. With Pliny, with Plato, there are seven copies, and the earliest one is uh, 1,200 years after the original writing. Let's go down to Eurip Eur excuse me, Euripides, 1,300 years, 1,300 years, and there's nine copies. Aristotle, 1,400-year difference, and yet there's 49 copies. Look at the New Testament, written less than, and we'll get into this, less than 100 years, and there's 5,600 copies. This is now up to 6,000. And it's 99.5% textually identical. I'm going to just, just segue right into the New Testament reliability. The Old Testament, reliable. The Old Testament, very accurate. What are the New Testament documents? You can see right here from what this is, this information here, and I have the documentation for where we get this, and you can contact me and get, get some more. But this is, this is the information that we have about the reliability of the New Testament. Now, I've got to introduce a concept. Okay, we can stop sharing the screen. I've got to, well, yeah, let's see. You know what? Maybe, I, I don't know. Hold on. I'm going to show you something else. Let that stay. And I'm going to show, uh, let's see, get this. There's something else worth looking at that deals with the issue of how the New Testament and the, the uh, documents are copied. Because you'll see right here, that in Greek, we have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta. These are letters. These are also numbers. In Greek, the New Testament is written in Greek. And in Hebrew, it's the same thing. They have one set of characters, Hebrew. And so the Aleph, Beth, so that it's one, two. And it goes on all the way down. And each of the letters are also numbers. The same thing in Greek. So when you're writing Greek letters, you're also writing numbers. Now, why is this important? Because when they would copy the words, they wouldn't copy by memory. They would copy letter by letter because they're, they're, they believe this is the word of God, particularly in the Old Testament. They, they did this. The scribes and the scholars, were, they were so reverent about how they would do this. When they would come to copying the name of Yahweh himself, then the copyist was to go change his clothes and wash and come back, copy the name of God, then go and change his clothes and wash and then copy more. And this happened each time the name of God was pronounced. They were they were so seriously reverential about the word of God. They copied it very, very, very carefully. To say it's corrupted just doesn't fit the historical narrative. This doesn't fit the facts. When we go to the New Testament, we see the same kind of a thing. In the New Testament context, a lot of people don't know this. People just didn't read and write like we do. They had what's called amanuensis, or they had scribes. The scribe's job, or the amanuensis' job, was to write down legal documents. They could be trained to write. They had been trained to write, and so their documents were before the Jewish Sanhedrin, before the Jewish court, as well as the Roman Empire, because they were part of the Roman Empire at that time. They had to write their documents accurately. How would they do that? Well, what they would do is write out words. When they would write out words, they're also writing out a series of letters. And in so doing, oh, there's so much that I could teach you guys, but there's so, in so doing, they would write out uh, how these words are. Like, for example, in Hebrew, the word God has a mathematical value of 86, or heaven has 390, or spirit of God is 300. In Greek, for example, Christos is 1,286, cross is 777, Ye uh, Jesus, Jesus is 888, fish is 1,224. Okay, why is this important? Okay, now you can unshare the screen there, I'll, I'll stop sharing it, or you can, uh, okay. The reason this is important is because when they would write the New Testament documents, they did what's called a codex. A codex is a page. Now, here's my Quran from, okay, it's a Quran from uh, Saudi Arabia. So a page. They would have a page, and it would, the original was written by the apostles. They'd write down, in Arche and Halagos, they would write this down on a line, and they would write each line. They'd write this down. This is inspired. When they would make a copy of it, they didn't go word for word. They went letter for letter, 
And when they would copy, they would have the original and they'd have the copy. And then what they would do was after they had a, an original page, a single page copied, what they would do is add up the numbers of the original on the horizontal line. They would add up the numbers on the horizontal line of the copy. Remember, when they're writing letters, the letters are also numbers. We have A, B, C, one, two, three. They only had one set, alphabet, uh, alphabet, gamma, delta, and those letters were also numbers. So when they're writing words, they're also writing numbers. When they're writing letters, they're also writing numbers. So they would write those letters, and then they would add up the letters because the letters are also numbers. They would then compare the mathematics of each one, the numbering system of each one, and they would say, okay, it matched exactly. That copy was then allowed to be presented and transmitted to other places. They would do books like this, and it was the job of the scholars, the amanuensis, it was a job of the scribes to write this accurately. Now, you've got to understand that when they would do this, they were doing this because this was their job. This was their livelihood. If they were writing legal documents that represented people and they were to mess up, their reputation was destroyed. Because legality could cause major problems. They had to be very, very accurate. They had their ways of copying stuff very accurately. And, and this whole idea was spread out all over the Mediterranean area because they didn't have Xerox machines or phones they could take pictures with. They had to copy. And the, the people who did this were very, very, very meticulous about it. So especially when you're a believer, a Christian, who believes that these are inspired writings. So this means then that when these copies were made, they were copied with such precision, with, with such accuracy, that the scholars have now stated that all of the copies, something like 6,000 copies, are 99.8% textually identical. There are a few variants in the text here and there. Like for the word, example of the word the in Greek is, a, is the letter O or an omicron. It's an O with a rough breathing mark over it, a little comma over it. It's a single letter, and that's the word the. The present, I mean, the nominative masculine singular form. It's the word the. Well, that little bitty the, which is just that big on a piece of parchment, might flake off because, uh, because you know, it just gets old. It might be 200 years old. And they would open it up and maybe just a little, it just flaked off. And then they would copy the, the codex and they would miss the word the. This would happen. This kind of stuff would happen. But you've got to understand something. Th figure this out. So they would originally be written here geographically, and then a copy would be sent 100 miles this way, and a copy would be sent 100 miles this way of the original. Now you have two copies. They could match these copies. These copies have been preserved in varying things like this, like wine goblets. This is a wine goblet. And it's, a, it's, it's authentic from 330 BC, plus or minus 10 years, Southern Italy. How do you know? Because that's the style that's used in the pot and the way it's done. This is actual, this is authentic. I've had it for many years. This is from 330 BC, for real, from Southern Italy. All right. Pots are a way of time stamping when uh, certain things happened in history and where it was. They put their documents, these copies, in these documents, and they would send them out to different places. That's how they were preserved. And they would be preserved in monasteries and different places. These documents were revered, and they were preserved. Archaeologists have uncovered these kind of documents, small fragments to whole, whole groups of documents. And they've been able to come together and and examine them, and their their uh, conclusion is that of all these Greek do New Testament documents, they're 99.8% textually identical. The lowest I've ever heard is 99.5% textually identical. So with the word the missing in one manuscript, but there in another, and it says uh, hakurios, the Lord, and in five manuscripts, the word the is there, but in the exact copy from another place, the word the looks like it flaked off. They'd say, well, there you go. That's a variant. But we know what the original is right there. So we know that it's there. They have this down so well, so well that they can reproduce the New Testament documents to something like 90.99% purity. It is insanely accurate. Nothing in ancient history comes even close to this. I'm just telling you this because that's the original, that this is how it's preserved. And you can do your research and you can find this stuff out. This is there. I've done this research. Now, here's something else to think about as well. The book of Acts is a very, very, very important book. 
It's a book of history written by Luke. The book of Acts does not contain the death of Peter and Paul for, that happened around 62 to 64 AD. And yet Luke worked with Peter. Why would he not record the death of Peter in the book of Acts? Logically, it's because the book of Acts was written before Peter died. In fact, in uh, Matthew 24, Jesus prophesies about the destruction of Jerusalem. That happened in 70 AD, and it's not recorded in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, you've got to understand, is a book of history. It has the, the death of, of um of Stephen in Acts chapter seven, it has the uh, the statements of Peter, of Paul. It has the missionary journeys. Uh, it is a book of history. The funny thing is about this in the book of of uh, Acts. I'm going to read to you Acts chapter one. This is important, and not a whole chapter. The first uh, the first verse. The first account I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he taken up to heaven. That's the opening of Acts chapter one. He says, the first account I composed Theophilus. So Luke wrote the book of Acts and he also wrote the book of Luke. And it says in Luke one verse three, because he's writing to undertake to compile an account of the things that were accomplished by Jesus and the disciples in verse one, handed down from the beginning, verse two, and in verse three, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out to you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. So what he's doing here in the book of Luke is he's writing this document to Theophilus. And there's some theories about why and who he was, interesting stuff, but we won't get into that. The book of Acts says, the first thing I wrote, Theophilus, He's referring to the book of Luke. That means Luke was written before the book of Acts. Why is this important? Because the book of Acts does not contain the historical markers of the death of Peter and Paul, which means then that it was written before then. Let's just say it was written at 60 AD. Well, the book of Luke obviously was written before that. It took a long time to compile the information. So we can't just say did it in two or three weeks. I can sit here at my computer, this is where I am. I have four, one, two, three, four, 27 inch 4K monitors. I have high speed internet. I have a voice recognition program I can use. I have Bible stuff. I have the internet, I have the Google Scholar. I have over 500 books on Kindle. I can search them all. I can search hundreds and hundreds of books in my Logos Bible program. I can collect information very quickly. I can document stuff. Not so back then. What would they do? Get on a donkey, get on a mule, walk, go find someone, write down, what did he say? And then go to another place, find another disciple, another witness. What happened? This takes a long time to do this. So let's just say, since the book of Luke is huge, and in fact, here's trivia. Luke wrote most of the New Testament, not Paul. Paul wrote more books, but the sheer number of words is uh, the greatest number of words written by one person is Luke. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. So he wrote most of the New Testament, a little bit of trivia there. So let's just say that the book of Acts was written around 60 AD, probably earlier, but I'll be generous. Let's just say 60 AD. And the book of Luke was written before that. Let's just say five years before that. Let's say 55 AD. Most scholars agree that the book of Matthew was written before that just for simplicity's sake, let's say five years earlier, that would make make it 50 AD. And most scholars agree that the book of Mark was written even before that. Let's just keep it simple and say five years before that. There's debate about this, it's even earlier, but five years before that, that'd be 45, uh, 45 AD. And yet Jesus was crucified in 33 AD. We're roughly talking 12 year difference. Now, can people remember stuff? Absolutely, over 12 years, absolutely. I can tell you details of June 19th, 1976, when I was involved in a, spe a specific car accident. I can give you details and details from 1976. You remember things. And when you have hundreds of people that you can go re reference and you can write and you can have access to the eyewitnesses, you can write down what was said. And they did. The book of Acts is a historical marker. And it's written before the death of Peter and Paul, roughly 60 AD, probably way before that. The book of Luke before that, but Matthew before that, and Mark before that. John, that's a little bit different. Some say a little earlier, some say a little bit later. It doesn't really matter. 
But the point is, the gospel accounts are written early, and the epistles are written before 60 AD also, because Paul died in 62 to 64 AD, and he had to write what he did, and he did that over 15, 20 years, maybe even 30 years earlier. So the New Testament is written early, and it's transmitted extremely well, meticulously, from then to now. They were very, very, very astute in how they copied, how they copied letter by letter the word of God. And these copies are all over the Mediterranean area. They're still finding manuscripts. They still add to the, to the collection. If it's the case that the New Testament's corrupted, as false religious systems say, then it must be the case that they produce the evidence of its corruption. But in order to do that, you have to find an original and compare it. That'd be difficult. You have to be able to explain how all the manuscripts are identical. Are they all corrupted? Are they all corrupted from all over the Mediterranean area? Did someone go around and find out where they are, are and altered the word of God? All these thousands all over the place? Is that what happened? No. To say it's corrupted is easy to claim, but to demonstrate it's corrupted is not easy. I've never heard anybody do this. And I've been discussing this stuff off and on for 42 years. I've not heard anybody come up with anything. The best that they can do is Muslims like to do. Well, the Bible's got contradictions in it. Well, if they want to say it has contradictions in it, I say, show me. And then we just look at the context and then they can't demonstrate a contradiction. And furthermore, they usually don't know what a contradiction is. It's an issue of logic and the second law of logic, LNC, the law of non-contradiction. And I'll ask them, tell me and define what a contradiction is so we can apply it truthfully to the issue that you're raising. And then if they want to say that there's a contradiction and the Bible can't be trusted, then we can go to the Quran and show contradictions in it. And it can't be trusted. So there's, there's a lot we could talk about. There's a lot of tangents we could get into. But <clears throat> the New Testament documents, uh, particularly about Jesus, are early written and extremely well preserved and meticulously copied from then to now. Just because someone comes along later and says, hey, the Bible's corrupted, doesn't mean it's the case. Muhammad didn't prove anything. Muhammad made mistakes and the Quran's got problems in it. And if it's from Allah, then we can look at it because in Surah 482, it says, if there's any discrepancy in the Quran, Quran, then it's not from Allah. And we can show them in the Quran. Therefore, it's not true. Simple. There's ways to do this. But yet the Muslims don't care. Why? Because they don't believe in the issue of truth. They believe in Muhammad. He's got to be true. But they can't demonstrate he is. They can't demonstrate the Quran is true. And it has problems in it. In the Bible, no, it doesn't. I challenge people. You know, I, I'm not saying I have every answer to everything. And there's sometimes people bring something up and I'll say, I got to go study it before I answer it. But I've written thousands of articles related to the scriptures of the Bible and hundreds of articles dealing with alleged contradictions and problems. I've done analysis of <clears throat> the reliability of the New Testament documents. I've done archaeological studies from the archaeologists, read up on stuff. And I'll tell you, the Bible is so accurate. It's not been corrupted. It is true. Because God is certainly capable of preserving his word, even though new people come along and say God failed and that they will be the ones who tell you what God really says. Well, I don't trust them. But I trust my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on that cross and who rose from the dead three days later. And the eyewitnesses wrote what they saw and they died for what they saw. Not for what they heard or believed. Lots of people will believe in something and die for it. But the disciples died for what they said they saw and what they wrote and what they had written, what was preserved in the New Testament, that Jesus Christ died on that cross and rose from the dead. Anyone who would contradict that is denying the eyewitness accounts very well preserved throughout history in the New Testament. And what they're doing is Jesus warned, and I'll get, end with this. Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
Jesus knows his people and the people who follow Jesus will know his voice. But he says those who don't know his voice, and he doesn't know them, they'll go after another shepherd, a false shepherd, Muhammad, Joseph Smith of Mormonism, Charles Taze Russell of Jehovah's Witnesses or whoever it might be, who say they are the ones who restored the truth. So Jesus is the one who calls his sheep to himself, but the false teachers call the sheep to themselves. And they want to use Christ to help them. But Jesus is the one who died on the cross, who rose from the dead three days later. Muhammad didn't do it. No one else has done it. So I'm going to believe Jesus over anybody else. And until someone can prove that the, go the Gospels and the New Testament is corrupted, I mean, prove it. Until they do that, I'm going to believe in what Jesus said. I'm not going to believe in something came that came along 600 years later from a guy who said he uh, got it from God and yet made all kinds of mistakes, all kinds. That's another topic. So there you go. There you go. Thank you so much. I, I, that was a short time and I, I learned a lot of things. I mean, I don't claim to know it all. I don't even know half of what I should know, but I didn't know about the, the numbers and letters matching and I didn't know that. What is that called? So I can look at Gematria. You want to spell that? <laughs> G-A-M-M-A-T-R-I-A. -M -M -A -A. And there's a lot of very interesting things about gematria. For example, in John 21, they, Jesus tells the disciples to cast a net over on the right side of the boat, not the left. The left are where the goats are in judgment. The right are where the sheep are in judgment. They're the ones who are saved. He says, I'll make you fishers of men. They catch 153 fish. Why 153? Well, the gematria for the word fish is 1,224. The gematria for the word Jesus is 888. Eight people in Noah's Ark circumcised on the eighth day, resurrection on the eighth day. There's eight comes up like this. Eight times 153 fish is the mathematical value of the word fish, which is just interesting. But what's really interesting is this, in the four Gospels, and I can bring it up and show it to you, I have it documented. In the four Gospels, guess how many individuals, not the 4,000, the 5,000, guess how many individuals received a blessing directly from Jesus himself? 153. The same number of fish that were caught in the net that were listed there that Jesus had. How did they know that since the four Gospels were written over 30 years span? And yet all of them together, that's exactly the number of the individuals blessed. The mathematics in the Bible, I can get into all, all kinds of stuff. I do this sometimes with people. It's weird. But there's all kinds of stuff like that in the scriptures. It's true. I can show you in the Old Testament stuff like that as well. I would love to hear <laughs> all about that. That almost sounds a little crazy, just a little bit. Like if someone were to be rambling all of these facts it just to, to anyone it would be like that guy's nuts well but, my name is slick i mean can you trust a guy named slick i mean really. come on it sounds whacked <laughs> um wow thank you for that um i'm gonna bring on um one of our team members david and he's gonna have some questions for or you know discuss where did, where did david go i thought i added him Hold he got on. raptured <laughs> <laughs> Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. All righty. Yeah, thank Welcome, you. David. Yeah, thank you very much. And Matt, thanks so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, very, sure. uh, very well done. Uh, interested that you went to, uh, to Cave One. Um, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm a little curious and, you know, loving the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and what that did to the validity of scripture. I mean, can you give us just a quick breakdown of how tall the, the cave was, how wide, sure. uh, how, what was the humidity? Yeah, was we had to walk, uh, we had a secret meeting. It's a secret thing we got snuck in. We had to walk across a few hundred yards of uh, flat area, and then there's this rock area. And I'll tell you, you walk up there, if you slip, you'll be gashed. The rocks are not like a, a hillside. It's they're, they're sharp. You have to be very careful. The next time I go, I'm supposed to go again next year. Uh, we have another trip coming up. I'll be wearing gloves and uh, because it's, it's sharp, which explains why no one went up there for so long. 
So it took about 15 minutes to, to traverse everything up. And we finally get up there. And there's this opening. I'd say, if I remember correctly, about two, maybe three feet wide at most, five-ish feet high. And it's uh, there's this cave thing. And that's what it is. And it's just dark inside because it's a cave. And so we would get up there. It wasn't a whole bunch of area. We had to kind of rotate through. And we went up and went inside, had a flashlight. And it was oh, six, eight feet deep, uh, you know, seven feet high, four or five feet wide, all jiggly and jaggly cave-ish. And there you were. And I was going, I'm in Qumran Cave 1. I'm going to brag about this for so many years. I'm in Qumran Cave 1. So, yeah, when you, that's when what you happened. Went into the cave, was there any kind of a steep incline or was it level inside the cave? Inside is level. I mean, it's, it's not perfectly level, but you yeah. can walk it very easily. Yeah, yeah it's level, it's level-ish. Deep, deep, uh, crevices or anything like that. Yeah, it was like you walk back a couple of feet. I think it dropped a foot or two kind of a thing over six, seven feet, that kind of a thing. Uh, because you're asking me when I go next year, Lord willing, when I get there again, I'll memorize more of it. Uh, but <clears throat> we had to help people up and down and and me, I just want to push them down the hill. It's a lot faster. But uh, okay. some of the guys said, probably not a good idea. So, okay, okay. you know. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Uh, it helps us to, to uh, be able to kind of live through your experience here. Oh, I got some more. I mean, when Israel is great. If you can ever go to Israel, go to Israel. I've walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. Yeah. I've, I've been, been to Masada, with... Ephesus. Awesome. Go to uh, Qumran Cave 1 with you again. Sounds like fun. Well, hey, you know, we still have a few spots left for the trip. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So there you yeah. go. Okay. Well, you know, in, in, our, in our ministry, we're, we're speaking to Muslims, and, and the Muslims have been taught uh, very early in age, uh, and they're indoctrinated. Uh, and as C.S. Lewis said, uh, more, uh, Muslims, uh, Islam is basically a Christian cult, is what he saw it as. And it's very cultish in nature because it's like our way is the only way. Don't, don't think outside of our box. And so they're told that the Bible's corrupted. And you, you, you know, address that. But in actually talking to somebody that's Muslim in their, their thought, in their mind, they see the Quran, what they're told, is 100% correct, but yet the Bible has errors. You know, in the trans, uh, transmission, it's been changed, it's been altered. What do you think is the best way to address that type of mindset? Um, there's a principle that I, I'm using more and more when I do apologetics. Now, apologetics is a defense of the Christian faith. Before I was on here, I was online talking. And they wanted to ask me about justification by faith. We didn't get into it. We got into some other things. I'm on regularly. I have spent thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours over 42 years uh, debating teaching, answering questions. It doesn't mean I'm right about everything. But what I'm, I'm bringing this up because there's different ways of analyzing stuff and responding to people. More and more as I get older, I'm discovering that presuppositional approaches are the best. Now, what I mean, say by that, and I'll explain it, is that we must use the word of God. Isaiah 55, 11 says the word of God will not come back empty without accomplishing what God desires. And, uh, you know, Acts 4, uh, Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is sharp and powerful. It, it can accomplish what it desires. You've got to use the word of God. Assume its validity. Don't assume that it's not true. You argue from the truth of God's word as though it's true because that is the truth. When a Muslim, and I've talked to many, say the Bible is corrupted, they're making an assertion. I'll ask them to validate the assertion. I'll, and I ask them, have you studied the textual reliability of the New Testament documents? Because the New Testament really is the issue of who Christ is. Have you studied it? They haven't. So you've not studied it, and yet you're going to pronounce that it's corrupt. Now, I know you say Muhammad says so, but we're going to get to that. So you've not studied the evidence, so you, you don't know. So I have. 
and it's not corrupt. And you can do your own research. In fact, I've got research on my website. Oh, I'm not going to go to your website. But then do your research. If you're going to make the statement that is corrupted, demonstrate your statement is true. A lot of Christians make a mistake. Muslim will say it's corrupted. Christian says, no, it's not. The Muslim says, prove it's not. Now the, the Christian's on the defense. The Muslim makes a, dis, a statement, the Bible's corrupted, show me. Now, there's two ways to, to attack the scriptures, internally and externally. They don't know the external issues or the reliability of the New Testament documents. What they're going to do is go internally. <clears throat> they're going to say the Bible's got uh, contradictions. <laughs> and I'm going to ask them, define what a contradiction is. Now, I know I'm, it's a long answer, but this, is, this lays a foundation down for other things as well. So what's a contradiction? Because if you say that one person was recorded at being at Jesus' tomb and another gospel says two people, is that a contradiction? And the answer is no. Because they'll say it is. They'll say you don't understand what a contradiction is. A contradiction occurs when one statement makes another statement impossible. If it says only one person was there, it cannot be the case that there's two. If it says there's one person there, then we know that there can be another person there. Just because it says one here and two there doesn't mean both are not possible. And I teach them, I say, look, you have to understand what logic is, because if you don't understand what logic is and how this applies, you cannot argue uh, cogently. You can't argue rationally. You can't make your case. So what I'm doing here is giving a little bit of a lesson for the Christians is that Pre, presuppose the validity of the word of God, and you just you argue from that because of Isaiah 55, 11. It's just true. you got to do that. Otherwise, you're calling God a liar. That's what they're doing. Second, if they make an assertion about the, the invalidity of the scriptures, ask them to demonstrate it. You can cross-examine their, their demonstration. <clears throat> and third, know what it means to have a contradiction. Because if they're going to say there's a contradiction occurs, show them that's not what a contradiction is. And I can give other illustrations about this principle, but that's what I'll do with them. And one more thing, I, I know I'm talking a lot. I, I apologize for that, but there's just so much associated with this. And I'll stay after we can talk more. Be gentle when doing this. Colossians 4, 5, and 6, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. And second, Timothy uh, 2, 24 and 25, the Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be gentle, with patient when, when wronged, uh, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perchance God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. So I do this respectfully. I say, and I'm gift, when I do this quickly, it sounds like I'm, I'm aggressive. I'm not. But when I do it in real time, you know, I, I just I appreciate what you're saying. But I want you to understand, I, I don't think you've really studied this. And well, let's go through this together, and that's what I'll do with them. Okay, it's a long-winded answer to your good, good question. So sorry no, about that. Not long, not long-winded at all. Uh, we're all here to to hear what you have to say and, and learn from your expertise. So, <gasps> can you call my wife up and tell her that? <laughs> uh, we can have a conversation after this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because you know my wife's not impressed. Maybe you can convince her. Yeah. Yeah, no, no profit is uh, is uh, not even <laughs> at home, right? That's right. So. I try to tell her, honey, I'm great. She goes, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so the the preservation, uh, according to uh, Muslims, is that uh, that the Quran is being preserved all the way down to the the you know every single jot and tittle, everything's 100 percent immaculate. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, that's the preservation idea. Uh, so if God preserved the Bible, why did he allow mistakes in transmission? Well, he allowed mistakes in transmission to demonstrate that it's authentic. That, that makes it counterintuitive. But if every single document was exactly the same in every single place, they'd say, there was they got them together and they made it look like this. That's an evidence of it's of of not trustworthy because everything's exactly if you have witnesses on a trial and they say the exact sentences all the time, the whole trial. They're, they're, they got together. You can't trust them. 
So the Muslims can have it both ways. You see, the accuracy of the Bible is demonstrated that it actually was distributed across a Mediterranean area. It was copied by real people. And it's something like 99.8% textually identical, which means, yeah, real people did do that. It really was copied back then. It really was authentic. We have evidence like that. What do they have? Nothing. Don't forget the Yemenis. Quran, which is different than the modern Quran. And there's other copies and stuff that is different. And I haven't documented those, so I don't bring them up very often. I got more to do. I'm working on the new apostolic reformation right now. I got so much to do. But there's there's issues. I say, if you want to say the Quran is correct, then you need to present to me say, the evidence. I want to know, why is the evidence of the Quran's transmission correct? Just because you say it, I'm sorry not to be disrespectful. I, why would you say, you know, show it to me? And all they've got is, it is. How do you know? Because it's corrupt. It's not corrupted. How do you know? Because it is. Well, then what I'm going to do, because they don't have any external means, I'm going to go internally. And I'm going to show them problems inside the Quran and say, well, you can't demonstrate that it is not corrupted, but it, you can't demonstrate it's reliable. So you don't have that expertise. You don't have that knowledge. You haven't done that homework. So let's look internally and see if there's problems in it. Because if it, there is a contradiction, according to the Quran, Surah 482, then we have problems. And then I show them the contradictions. Yeah, the flip side of the external uh, witness of Scripture is is Islam with, uh, with their manuscript where, like you said, it's, well, we don't have this death amount of manuscripts. Uh, I think they, they only have uh, three, I think it is. Uh, in the world that they consider to be, you know, authentic, original uh, manuscripts. And they don't, they don't put that to the, sh uh, to the light of textual criticism. And so it's, it's by faith. It's, there's no, there's no scientific or any kind of methodology behind it other than, like you said, believe us, this is the way it is. Do you know what non-falsifiability is? Or you ever heard of that? Yeah, I've, uh, I've asked that to Muslims before in, in okay. uh, debating this issue. Because the issue, for example, is the, is the resurrection of Christ falsifiable? Can it be shown to not be true? If you say there's no way to show it's not true, then it's non-falsifiability. Generally speaking, when something's non-falsifiable, it doesn't exist in reality. When things happen in real time, there's evidence for and if there's a lack of evidence for, then it tends itself towards non-falsifiability and therefore without credibility. We can take this principle, and I can expand on it, but we could take it and apply it to the Quran. Is it non-falsifiable? Where are the documents? Have they been examined? How ancient are they? Are they exactly identical? Because if these three documents are really original, then everything should be exactly identical, is it? Where's the evidence that it's exactly, that these are exactly identical in everything? If there's one little thing that's a change, well, then you have corruption, don't you? Which is the original. And we can apply the same standard to them. But here's the problem is most of the time, critics of scripture, of the Bible, they can accuse, but they don't like the standard applied to their own criteria in their own situation. And in that, no disrespect men, honestly, but they don't realize they're being hypocritical in that. And they need to change that. This applies to us as well. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, changing tracks, you know, staying in Scripture. Uh, but one of the objections that we get from uh, the Muslims, it, again, it's a it's a mindset. So Islam Islam states that the uh, the Quran was communicated by uh, the angel Gabriel. So it was a, a direct transmission. It was written down completely accurate and we know that not to be true but we're we're dealing with muslims that have been indoctrinated to this uh this thought so in their mind it would be better and it's more secure that it was it's communicated by the angel gabriel than the idea of inspiration so what would you say to that well that would be inspiration 
uh, Theopneustos, 2 Timothy 3.16, God breathed. They were saying then that the Quran, which exists in heaven, was transmitted by uh, Gabriel and it was given to Muhammad in the darkness of a cave, which I think is really interesting. He received his stuff in darkness. Instead of let there be light, he was in darkness. That's the opposite. I think that's, that's uh, there's something there. Uh, <clears throat> and that would be of uh, inspiration. They hold to the idea that the Quran is the holy word of God, that what it says is true. And so therefore, in everything it addresses, it accurately represents the thing from God. That's inspiration. That's inspiration. So what they're, and I have to do this with them. So what you're saying is the div the divine word aspect of God is in material form, right? And they'll say, yes, it, Hey, that's what we teach about Jesus. He's that word, material form. We call him a man. You can have it here, but not there. And I get it. That's try and get into the witnessing about who Christ is. That's, hey, slick and quick. You know, I, I'm slick. I got to use it. You know, I got to go in there. So anyway, so if if they're going to talk about Gabriel, I'm going to ask him, how do you know this is true? I constantly will say this. How do you know? Now I say, I'm not saying prove it to me like a mathematical theorem. Give me sufficient evidence. If you're going to say, well, Muhammad said so, okay, how do you know then what's the reasonable questions to ask about his reliability? Because if it's really from Allah, then can't we look at the Quran to see if there's internal inconsistencies? And if there are, then is it really from Allah? Since itself says in Surah 42, if there's any discrepancy, it's not from Allah. And then we show them to him and then we have discussions about him. And so that's what I'll do. Take what they say and work with it and then show them the problems according to what they've already said. It's not a principle of apologetics. That's great. I, uh, I like the way that, uh, that you flesh that out and in uh, able to, to really uh, present that because we're talking about a mindset and, mm -hmm. and being able to to penetrate that mindset and not just the argument, right? But the, the mindset mm -hmm. and the indoctrination that they've had uh, for so long. That's right. You know, one of the things I like to do with them, here's a little, just a t tidbit. And I'll say, uh, in Exodus 314, it's what I'll ask them about the Quran, because to them, the Quran is everything. But God says in Exodus 314, uh, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now that means it's the name of God. Now that phrase, that wording occurs over 3,500 times in the, uh, in the Old Testament. Now, we can get into the issue of uh, Lord and how many times God's name is mentioned because the name is mentioned so many times. In fact, what I'm doing right now on my Bible program is looking up exactly, this is a reason I'm doing this, exactly how many times the word Yahweh occurs that's his name 6517 times in the old testament god's name is important and i'll say this is there so this is from you agree that, that that's from god right now he's revealed himself would you tell me that every single instance in the old testament of god's name being used is corrupted now they do they got a problem but 6,500 times, and I ask him, why is it your God, if he's the God of Abraham, doesn't mention his own name in the Quran? Why is it not there? Why the discrepancy? Why is your God not identifying himself by his name as he does in the Old Testament? I ask him questions like this. They want to challenge the Bible? I'm going to challenge the Quran. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Why That's is that? That's a great, a great, a great question. Good point. Yeah. yeah, it is. How come Allah didn't, you know, that's his name, God? Why come he didn't say, I am, if he's the God of Abraham? How, how come that, that's the case? In fact, it first occurs in Genesis 2, 4. The Lord God made heaven and earth from the very beginning. His name is I am. Anyway. Yeah. A little I mean, digression there. The whole idea of hijacking uh, a religion and trying to, to, you know, pin your coattails on on, a, on what came before you, uh, rather than rather than coinciding with the promise that God laid down through Abraham, 
You yeah. circumvent and you insert yourself into that to make it look like you're legitimate. That's right. In fact, it says uh, in Genesis 24, 1, now Abraham was old, advanced in, in age, and Yahweh had blessed Abraham and everything. When you go to Genesis 18, 1, oh, it's very interesting because it says now Yahweh, that's I am, appeared to him by the Oaks of Mamre. So Abraham who you say is your ancient father from Islam, you know, <clears throat> Ishmael. He knew the very name of God. And your Quran says has a, it's the true God. Why is it that it doesn't have his name that is so important to Abraham? Why do you, does Muhammad ex exclude it? Why would Muhammad do that in the Quran if it's really from God who wants his name known? What I'm subtly doing is challenging the validity of the Quran in a manner they're not used to. Yeah, that's a fairly inescapable argument right there. So another another question that comes up from time to time is that the, the Bible was put together uh, in a contrived manner uh, through the uh, through the I think it was the Council of Trent through Constantine. And then, Council of Trent's 1500s, Constantine around 400 years. Yep. So uh, the uh, the Muslims that we come across will will again try to uh, you know disparage the uh, disparage the scriptures. Will say that it's you know man made. It's it contrived because it was it was an act of Constantine to bring this together. What would uh, what would be a good response for that? As I say with respect. You don't know the history. You don't know what had happened. And I and I I am trying to be careful with them. And 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 there are different tacks to take with them. But for the most part, look, I, I just need you to know that I can tell you've not studied this issue. You've just read things. You need to study this because you don't want to bear false witness. Now, do you? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't bear false witness. But nevertheless, the issue is that when they have to understand the historical context, then they'll understand why it took a while. When the apostles wrote what they did, it was inspired of God. The church didn't declare it inspired. The church recognized it. But in 70 AD, basically, uh, the entire New Testament had already been written. There's some debate about Revelation. We'll get into all those specifics. It doesn't really matter at this point. But so by 70 AD, basically, let's just say, let's assume for the argument now that all the books had already been finished. Maybe Revelation after, but we'll just say this. So there it was, the Christian church already knew who the apostles were and who the amanuensis of the apostles were, like Mark and Luke, written under their authority and direction. But Nero in the 60s was persecuting the Christians, and he would take them, strip them naked, put tar on them, put them on poles, and then light their bodies on fire in order to uh, illuminate their night parties of orgies and uh gluttonous festivals. The Christians were under persecution. And when Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem, Ro the Roman Empire had considered that the Christians were a sect, a subdivision of Judaism. But they were attacking the Jews, so they're going to go after the Christians too. They don't really care what the truth is. They're going after everybody. It's called the diaspora, the dispersion. The, the Christians dispersed all over the Mediterranean area. Now, <clears throat> They would not have all these councils right away because they're under heavy persecution. They're running for their lives. They're dispersed all over the place, carrying these documents that are then written and copied meticulously all over the place. As Christianity grew and then dominated in the Roman Empire, then it became permissible to have councils that would then come together. They recognize and says, we've always had these documents. Let's put them together and we'll call it uh, the, the, the corpus or the canon of scripture. This happened later. It was not the case that Constantine decided who would or what would be in the Bible. That's just a gross, inaccurate, ignorant misrepresentation of historical fact. It has no basis in reality. All that they did was recognize and gather these things together, just as Uthman supposedly gathered all the stuff together and said, this is what's authentic. It's the same principle that happened, but it took a couple, 300 years because they're under heavy persecution. They're being murdered. 
And there's all kinds of stories. Christians being stripped naked, put out on a lake, a frozen lake. And said, and the Romans saying, if you come back and you, you bow to Caesar, Caesar papism will let you live. Otherwise, you stay out here and die. What are they going to do? Hey, let's have a big council and bring our sacred documents in. The Romans would love that. Come in and kill them, wipe them out. This is why it took a while. And when we understand this, we understand that these Christians who are bleeding for the faith are going to preserve these sacred documents. And there's a whole other issue about the sacred documents and what's called the Donatist issue, the Donatist error. And it has to do with things related to this. It's another topic. It's, it's there in ancient history. It's there, and, and I like to say to the Muslims, not that I want to, like, I don't mean like as in a, I got pleasure out of this. What I mean is I will say to them frequently, I'm sorry, but you, you need to study this. I'm not trying to call you ignorant or, or stupid. You're not. But if you don't have the facts, you're going to get more errors. And the facts are not what you say. Please study this. But if you do, I'm going to challenge you that if you study and you find out it's not what you've been taught by your Muslim f- friends, are you going to believe the facts or are you going to continue to suppress them and believe what Muhammad said? 600 years after Christ, instead of the eyewitnesses who knew him, who saw him rise from the dead, who saw this. Yeah, there's definitely a choice to be made when somebody uh, comes to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Uh, whether to continue to, to continue on with life as is and, and just enjoy society as they have or to, uh, or to make that shift. And, and for Muslims, a lot of times it's a, it's a deep price that they have to pay. Yeah. There's a question on the screen. Yeah. Did you scroll written consonants? I believe it was just in consonants, but I don't know. It's not something I've studied per se, because the Old Testament, the Hebrew didn't have consonants. They put the vowel points in later. And so it was written in consonants as running, running, run on. And they, they knew that Greek, however, does have consonants. I mean, vowels. So. Okay. We have, know. we have another question here. Uh, you want me to read it or you? Muslims come up with a numerical miracles, like the famous 19, which was refuted in a debate with Anthony Shabir, came up uh, with more numbers as evidence of Quran. How are, how are your, yours not different? Oh, I would just say this. Look at them. Just do your own studies. Just do them. In fact, here, I'll show you something. Okay, do your own studies. All right. You can go to i'll share my screen or you put the screen back up uh let me get this there you go see that right there this is matthew's account this is the greek of uh, matthew 1 18 through 25 down here at the bottom this is the greek this is the english there's the greek and the number patterns that are in this pericope a pericope is a section of scripture 160 words, which is 23 by 7. 896 letters, 128 times 7. The 160, of those 161 words, that occur 105 different forms, which is 105, which is 15 times 7. And you can read through this. There's, there's just, I mean, we can't get into this right now, but there's stuff like this. The number of words in that is another set of scripture. You can go look. You can take a, a screenshot of this. And you can go look. I think I put this up on Karm. I believe I just look up Gematria. I do so many articles. I can't remember what I write sometimes. I believe these are up and you can go check them out. So how is this possible? How is this possible? Now, it's certainly possible that we can have certain kinds of patterns that are uh, that you can find in different um, in different uh Writings, you can certainly do that, but there comes when you do mathematical analysis and you start realizing at a certain point when it becomes ridiculous to say that uh, it's just coincidence, it has to be inspired. Now, here's the thing about inspiration. If the Muslims want to use the same level and criteria, let's do the same thing. Do they have these number patterns? Oh, let's examine them. Just saying it isn't the case. I'm showing you this. I show people, look at this. Look at it right here. But the Muslims, what they'll tell me is, well, it's been analyzed by blah, blah, blah. Show it to me. And I say, here's my email address, info at karm.org. Email it to me. Guess how many people have emailed it to me? Zero. Zero. Zero, zero, zero. All right. Uh, I was going to show you one thing. 
let's see if I got it up here really quickly. Uh, I got so much stuff I can show you about the, the Bible. It's just awesome. Can I um, just but, say that I'm glad my salvation does not rely on math because <laughs> and all these right. numbers, this that's a lot of all the math that's involved in all of that. You know, we can't get into this very much, but I can show you, I can talk about the issue of the transcendental nature of mathematics and the universality of the universals called logical absolutes and how they can exist only in a transcendental mind. This requires a universal mind. Islam can propose that, but in Islam, there's the problem of the static ubiquity of God's knowledge without any development or alteration. And I can get into why it's a problem with a Unitarian view of God, which is what Muslims have, how the Trinity uh, solves a problem can also get into the issue of what's called the one and the many, which is how particular manifestations of universal principles occur in the world. What's the necessary precondition that must allow for those ex to be extant? Islam fails in that. Christianity and Trinitarian worldview does not. There's so many different levels of attacking stuff in uh, the view that we can get into. Most people have no clue that these even exist. But uh, <clears throat> check this out. Here's... Oh, I, you know what? I got so many things I could say. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'll just, I could go on and on. And Why? On. Got more questions. But do it. Uh, the, well, we, the, the we do a, a real let's do a show sometime and I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. You can unshare it. Sorry. But, you know. Okay. Let's see. I, well, have I can get a, some sophisticated another... stuff. I can get some deep stuff about logic and stuff with God. In fact, I'm I teaching a Bible study on Thursday nights on God, and my statement about the Trinity is 500 words long. Wow. And I'm teaching on it. Very thorough. <laughs> and it, it'll expand. Yeah. Anyway. What, what's your favorite Quran contradiction? Uh, instead of saying the word contradiction, but discrepancy would be uh, Surah 86, uh, wow. which is a contradiction from facts. Uh, Surah 86, 5, uh, let's see, 86. <clears throat> I love this. Uh, now, I'm a father and Sorry, I got to bring it up, but I had a vasectomy and uh, I remember it well. I remember where they went. I remember what happened. You remember this kind of stuff. Uh, so I know where a man's seed comes from, but Surah 86, 5 through 7, let man but think from what he's created. He's created from a drop emitted proceeding from between the backbone and the ribs. Well, that's up in the chest area. And I have a funny word I use at this point, but don't be disrespectful. So I say, that's wrong. And the gymnastics that they go through about this, they'll say, a backbone is feminine, ribs is masculine. See? Boy, it's miraculous. Between the male and the female. But that's not what it says, male and female. It says between the backbone and the ribs. And it says a drop, which is a smaller segment of a larger body of liquid. So we know what this is talking about. The sex act in coitus. And I'm being as polite as I can. So the seminal discharge is what is being spoken of that Muhammad says originates from the chest. Obviously, he's wrong. Flat out. But remember... Surah 42, if there's any discrepancies, it's not from Allah. There's a discrepancy. I just proved all of Islam false. Simple. Quick and slick. That's just one of them. There's more. Quick and slick. I like that. You need a shirt that says that. Quick and slick. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. I got a lot of shirt uh, sayings. Ideas? You know, to carm or not to carm. Or what do you call it when the website goes down? Carmageddon. You know, and all <laughs> kinds of stuff. <clears throat> I like it. Uh, we, I have a question that's um, not on this that I won't be able to put on the right. screen, but this is uh, um, Second Timothy three sixteen reviews that the Old Testament is God breathed, but what about the New Testament or reveals? I'm sorry, Second uh, Timothy three sixteen reveals that the Old Testament is God breathed, but what about the New Testament? Uh, it's all of scripture and the church recognizes the word of God. That's the issue. It recognized that what Paul wrote, for example, was scripture. Peter even says, uh, let's see if I can find it. Second Peter, where he says, uh, yeah, second Peter 316, Peter, who was called by Jesus and such. Anyway, he says, 
in all his letters, talking to Paul, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which are the untaught and unstable distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures. The implication is Paul's writings are scripture. Paul would even say, I'm writing to you from the Lord. And even say, not, not the Lord, but me, and sometimes me and the Lord. And he recognized he was writing inspired word. And church recognizes the word of God because in John 10, 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And notice that they hear the voice of Jesus, who the, Maha the, the Muslims follow, the voice of Muhammad. Yep. Jesus walked on water. Muhammad did not. Jesus raised the dead. Muhammad did not. Jesus fulfilled incredible prophecies, which when you put them together mathematically exceed the universal probability bound. Can't happen by chance. Muhammad didn't. And Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. He is. A lot of Christians say he's not. You know, he is. Matthew 24, 24. Hmm. The last days, many false Christs and false prophets will arise and deceive many. And since Allah changed someone to make him look like Jesus, Surah 4, 157, then Allah, by his direct hand, is a deceiver. You want to trust the Quran and trust Muhammad when Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Matthew 11, 27, Luke 10, uh, Luke 10, 22, 23. He said this, come to me, I will give you rest. Actually, it's Luke uh, 10, 28. Jesus points to himself. The father bears witness of Jesus. Listen to my son in Matthew 3. The prophets bear witness of Jesus in Acts 10, 43. Jesus bears witness of himself. Holy Spirit bears witness of him. Give you the verses. Was Muhammad do? Muhammad, the prophet, uh, uh, Allah and his prophet, Allah and his prophet, Allah and his prophet. And doesn't mention the name of God, I am. And Jesus says the truth bear witness of me. He says the Holy Spirit will bear witness of him. John 15, 26, John 14, 26. And they claim Jesus, or Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, the comforter, Herakletos, which does not, doesn't work for a lot of reasons. And yet he's not bearing witness of Christ. But says, oh, no, Jesus just a prophet. Wasn't crucified when the Bible says, yeah, he was. Why should we believe in Islam? And one of the things I like to ask Muslims, I say, when you die, where are you going? And that's a whole nother question. And then I have other stuff I can say. I got, I got stuff I could say. I keep going. Sorry. So Matt, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier. And that was the idea of taking the high ground with scripture, believing in God, believing that yes. his word doesn't come back void. Yeah. And standing on the truth of God. So the, the, the idea that the, the scripture is corrupted is a means of keeping somebody from getting to further, a further conversation, a deeper conversation. So in other words, like the, the, the deity of Christ, the, the substitutionary atonement, things that, things that you really want to get to, what would you say to the, the group here as far as engaging with Muslims that are bringing up objections uh, with, about Scripture? Uh, is that something we want to engage with right up at, up at the front? Do we want to try to sidestep that at all? Do we want to get into some other types of discussions? Is that kind of a fluid, be led by the Spirit type of thing? How would, you, how would we, uh, you know, what's your suggestion as far as engaging Muslims in those types of topics while they're saying that the scripture's corrupted? What I always do is ask questions. I want to find out a particular individual's presuppositions and assumptions. And depending on what they say, because I'll often write them down. I type quickly. I have a speech recognition program and I can have things recorded. And so I do this in my debates and I'll say, but you said, these are the words you said. And then I will use them against them. It's not that I'm looking for problems. It's that I'm looking for problems. You see, on one sense, I'm not there just to hurt them and trap them. But on the other hand, I know because they don't have the truth that they're going to be inconsistent. Because if a foundation is not true, there are going to be problems. So I'm looking for those. I'm going to ask questions. and I'm going to find them. And I will find them. Because they are there, because they don't believe the truth, because they don't have Christ, because they don't have the mind of Christ. They don't have the true gospel. They don't have the true God. And therefore, I will find them because they're there. Now, 
sometimes it takes a little bit more expertise to be able to find logical issues and logical problems. And, and like when I debate atheists, and they, I got told early on, <clears throat> they were not accustomed to an, a Christian using as, as much logic as I did. They weren't used to that. It threw them for a loop. And I destroyed many atheists' arguments uh, based on this. You can do the same thing with Muslims. They're going to make a claim. They need to validate the claim. But we as Christians do not make the mistake as a Christian of allowing the Muslim to judge God. God judges them. God judges us. We always assume the truth of who Christ is, the truth of God's word, the truth of the Trinitarian um, nature of God. Always assume them and argue from them. God doesn't defend his own existence. He simply declares it. He doesn't defend the scriptures. He declares it. Now, we can defend, and I, we know stuff. First Peter 3.15 says to give an answer to everyone who would ask it with gentleness and reverence, etc. We're to give answers, but we're always to bring them back, dear Christian, to the person and work of Jesus. You know, if you're at a church and you hear a sermon where Jesus and the cross are not mentioned, then it's a bad sermon. It's moralism. It's a truth that's unfounded in the work of Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. We must, as Christians, always believe in the word of God, presume the truth of the word of God, the power of the word of God, and argue from that perspective. So what I will do is bring an argument. I might spend 15, 20 minutes showing that they don't have an accurate understanding, explain what logic is, explain universals, explain whatever principle is necessary, and then bring them to the point of, and yet Jesus died. So an atheist, once again, rec, rec, uh, I was just talking to last week, he said, what's your best argument for Christianity? Jesus rose from the dead. That's it. Rose from the dead. Well, that's all you got? Didn't say that's all I've got. You said, what's the best argument? You didn't say, is that all I have? I didn't say that. You're, being, you're not listening. I said, the best argument is he rose from the dead. And... That's it. And then they attack that. I say, well, why would they be that? No, the Muslim, it has to be corrupted. Well, how do you know it's corrupted? And you're now you're having them attack the resurrection of Christ, and you're defending it according to the eyewitnesses. You're right where you want them to be, in the Word of God, as you read scriptures and says this and this and this. Now, there's so many things I could show you. So many things. I think it's worth bringing something up. So let me do this. I'm going to bring up an, uh, an outline I'm going to show you, which I recommend Christians do, and wait for it to come up on my screen. And if you could share that, this is my outline on Catholicism. I'm only going to do this as an illustration. There's a table of contents. Okay. Oops, come on. There we go. And this is the left side. So I have stuff on the Apocrypha. What is the Apocrypha? The authority. It goes down. Outline. All I'm showing you is I do outlines. Catechism of the Catholic Church. This thing is, come on, how far, how big is it? This thing is, I think it's like 185 pages long. Okay, when it, when it finally paginates. Here are more outlines I'm working on. Mormonism, Calvinism, science, philosophy, Catholicism, the canon of scripture, slavery in the Bible, uh, God's existence, the one and the many issue, it's a philosophical thing, government, baptism, goes on. Why am I bringing this up? Okay, I shared this, you can unshare it now. The reason I'm bringing this up is, if you want to learn to witness, you have got to learn how to memorize scripture. Okay, I've got hundreds memorized because I do this all the time. Okay, so don't think you got to have hundreds, but get an outline, write down with the things, have one for Muslims, have one for Mormons, have one for you know alien abductees, whatever it is, and you put down the scriptures and the things necessary that are related to that because you can't memorize everything. But I do this all the time. And I have them a lot memorized. And there's still a lot more. I'm going, okay, I can memorize this, memorize that. There's, it's never going to end. So what you do is you develop outlines and you have them on your computer or your, whatever, your phone. And you can quote things. In fact, I put some of these things up on carm.org forward slash C-U-T, cut, for cut and paste. It'll take you to a set of outlines I've developed. And you can go and you can, you can put cut and paste stuff in there. You can put it right in there. 
And then you can become quick and slick. And you can get in there and do all that stuff. See, I want to teach Christians. I want to teach them theology. I want to teach them the logic and apologetic procedures. I want to teach them what the scriptures say. I want to teach them things they don't know exist in the scriptures. I can show you stuff in the Bible you don't know is there. I want to teach them how to do apologetics, how to defend the faith, and how to tie it into the person and work of Jesus Christ who died on that cross and rose from the dead by whom we're saved. Amen. This is our Lord. Amen. And we want to learn. We want to learn all of that. And that copy and paste or cut and paste, that is something that I have used many, 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 many times. It's a great Good resource. for you. Yes. And if you see weaknesses in it or some areas that need more, let me know. I can put more in there. Okay. Okay. It's good. I have a lot to learn and I'm corrected. And George, boy, does he know a lot about Islam. I love sitting with him and I learn from him. Boy, he is good. Not as slick and quick as me, but he is good. He is. He's good. George is good. Yes. Is uh, David? Do you have anything else that you? Um... No, I don't. I don't have any more questions. Thank you so much, Matt. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, that's um, fine. Good timing. I go to go to dinner and um, with some friends. So hey, I'll do this anytime. I'd be willing to teach and uh, just ground people in stuff. Well, we're going to hold you to that. I am at least going to hold you to that. Um, I, we want to thank you. I know the chat was so happy to have you and all the questions. And, you know, you, you always uh, bring a good, you attract a good crowd and everyone's so eager to learn from you. And um, so we just want to thank you and we will have you back because you said it and I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> Okay. And uh, uh -oh. thank you um, the, to the chat. We uh, appreciate all of your questions always. And you guys know, just know that next week is Mother's Day. So uh, Ministry to Muslims, we are taking that day off. Uh, Pastor George will probably put something up, um, but we won't be live. So we will see you the week, the Sunday after that. So thank you guys for joining and God bless you guys. Have a great week. God bless you, too. We'll see you. God bless everybody. God bless. Bye. Bye.